Director of the Statistics Division here at SCAP, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this very first Stats Cafe, Asia Pacific Statistics Cafe. We uh, have established this, this cafe series to bring to you information in response to questions that you've put to us, um, not just in response to COVID-19, but more broadly on things that you're trying to do there in your national statistical offices. And for our first Stats Cafe today, we're bringing to you a very, very exciting topic on um, access to national and subnational population estimates, uh, demographic estimates, and how do we bring those together with GIS technologies and skills for um, the displaying of uh, really quite vital information for um, COVID-19 responses. This um, first CAFE series, just for your information, is being brought to you through a platform here called MS Teams. If you uh, look in your uh, the MS Teams, uh, there's a little bar. If you move your mouse to the middle of the screen, a little bar will come up. The first um, icon there can turn your video on and off. The second one can turn your mute button on and off. And I certainly would ask you all, please, to keep yourself on mute until we have the question and answer time. There is also fourth, fifth button along there, a hand, which we can use later on for the question and answer. If you have a question, we can uh, please do put your hand up. Or if you can't see that icon, next to it, there's another icon, which is a chat but button. And that chat button will bring on to the right-hand side of your screen a meeting chat box. And certainly, please put your questions in that meeting chat box, and I'll come and we'll come to you later on in the meeting. Either use the chat box function or the hand function, and we can come to you then. Um, this this um, um, first Stats Cafe will be recorded and we'll make it available to us on our website, so you can share it with your colleagues later. Just a reminder, asking everyone if you could please please be on mute uh, so that we can give the floor to our presenters. So we're coming to you today um, from four different locations across across the world. I'm I'm speaking to you here from um, Australia, and I'll hand over in a minute to my colleague Petra Namas, who's speaking to you from Denmark. We'll then hand over to Alessandro Soracheta and Maxim Bondarenko from who are both at uh, the University of Southampton and part of the World Pop Group and they're based in the United Kingdom. And finally, we have the pleasure to have Linda Peters from Esri who's coming to us this today from uh, California. She's still in Tuesday's time period. The rest of us are on Wednesday's time period. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Petra, who's going to be moderating this today. Thank you, Petra. Hi, thank you. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Gemma. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you're located. Um, yeah, we're really excited to be kicking off the first uh, Stats Cafe uh, series with this topic on um, subnational population estimates. Um, I'm going to be uh, starting with a quick uh, background and motivation to, to this topic. And then I'm going to be handing over to our colleagues from WorldPOP, uh, Alessandra and Maxim, who will be talking about uh, how WorldPOP uh, calculated and derived their subnational population estimates and some guidance on how you can download and use these, uh, these estimates. And then... Um, uh, Linda Peters of Esri is going to be talking about how you can use GIS products to further analyze the geospatial population data. Um, so I'm actually going to, I have had a sneak preview of the, um, of the presentations and because they are so excellent, um, the ones which are coming, not my one, <laughs> I have decided to uh, cut down a little bit. I'm going to go through very quickly to make sure that we have time for the far more interesting topics of how to actually uh, use the subnational data. Um, now, I hope you can see my screen. Can someone confirm that uh, you can see it? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect. 
Um, so this yes. uh, start, this um, this topic came up um, when we were looking at the the COVID nineteen response, and uh, as many of you know, the the information was coming out about how important sex and age was to uh, to COVID nineteen fatality rates. Um, and uh, there was a lot of demographic work that was coming that was showing uh, the importance of the, the sex and age breakdown for being able to predict the, the effect of COVID-19. Um, and this graph is taken from some work which was coming out of a demographic group at the University of Oxford. And what you can see here on the left is a population pyramid from two countries, Brazil and Nigeria. They've got approximately the same population size, two big countries of around 200 million. But as we know, Nigeria has a much younger population, a much younger population structure than Brazil. So the red is showing the uh, Nigerian um, uh, population pyramid and the blue is showing the Brazilian one. And as you go up the age groups, you can see that Brazil has a, has a much older uh, population than the Nigerian one. And then if you go to the uh, to the chart on the right, you can see how this is going to translate into the expected deaths for the same um, scenario uh, um, of uh, infection. So they assumed like 10% prevalence, the same case fatality rates as were seen in Italy. And you can just, you can see how much the age structure is affecting with everything else being the same. The, uh, the expected deaths with m much, much higher death rates um, in, um, in Brazil than in Nigeria. And they did a similar exercise for um, two other countries, Italy and the Republic of Korea. Again, both of them kind of a similar size, 50, 60 million. But Italy has a, an older population. Its fertility decline was much earlier and uh, it has this uh, oldest old population of more people aged 80, 90 plus. And then again, if you just apply the same scenario to this population, holding everything else the same, you can see that the expected deaths in uh, Italy are much higher than those in um, Korea. So it's clear that you know, this, this age and sex structure is, is, is critical for understanding and being able to plan and respond to uh, the pandemic. Um, similarly, some other work was done where you they applied the same case fatality rates to the two differing population structures. And this is just an example using some of the countries in our region where you can see that the countries with the youngest age structures, again, it's just reiterating the same point to so Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Papua and New Guinea, who have younger age structures, will have lower fatality rates holding everything else the same than the countries with the older populations, such as China, Thailand, and Australia. And this difference is, is very significant. Um, so we know that you know, age and sex is not everything. There's lots of confounding and additional factors. I mean, age is correlated with uh, increase in diabetes and obesity and hypertension and all kinds of diseases. And there's many other factors which um, uh, can be brought into the uh, to the equation. It's not just about age and sex. We know that, but we also know that age and sex is is very uh, is easily available. And it's and it's even if we know that this is um, correlated, it might not be causing age by itself. But if we know the age, we can we can make a certain assumption. So we don't necessarily, if we don't have the data, need to know all about these confounding conditions. It's much harder to get data on what's the prevalence of obesity. But we can get very easily the, the data on how many older people there are in the population. And similarly, we looked a little bit at the response. So it's not just about how the pandemic is going to, uh, in terms of the the impact, the direct impact of COVID-19, but also the response. Age and sex is also very, it's very important to know uh, the, the the breakdown. For example, the school closures, then there's how can we can make sure there's continuing primary care and addressing um, out of school children and um, issues around gender-based violence and the lockdown and so on. So we have to also know the age and sex structure in order to have, to be able to have a comprehensive and inclusive response. Um, so that's um, you know the, the the setting for why 
age and sex is important. So uh, we were looking at the national level uh, data in, in the region and in Asia Pacific, there's a very wide variation in the, the population. We have countries uh, mostly in East Asia, some of the Central Asian countries, uh, New Zealand and Australia, where there's been, um, there's been a long fertility decline at the end of the demographic transition. And there's some uh, countries with significant proportions of elderly uh, people in the population. But then we go right across to the other side with uh, uh, countries like Afghanistan, where the population is very young. So we're talking about you know, nearly a third of the population aged 60 plus in Japan, all the way through to the relatively low proportions of under 5% in Afghanistan. So we could see at the national level, there's a, this very, very wide variation. And this data is easily available. But then we were thinking, OK, but this isn't that helpful because policymakers need to know what's going on at the subnational level. And that's when we were really excited to see what World Pop had done and that they had made available at the subnational level um, this age and sex breakdown. So when we looked at the subnational level, we could see there was also there's not just wide variation among countries, there's also wide variation within countries. So, for example, um, for example, uh, India. We, if you look at the administrative uh, units in India, you can see this wide level of subnational variation. So on the left. This is an example taken from a municipality in Kerala in the south of India, where there's been relatively low, low fertility. And you can see that uh, here the pro proportion of elderly is relatively high. And then if you go to the uh, example on the right, which is taken from a district in northeast uh, India, you can see this is a, a traditional uh, young age structure with relatively few um, older people at, at the top of the population pyramid. So we can see that actually within countries there's also significant variation. I have another example taken from Vietnam. And I, I brought in this example because you can see here that there's different proportions sometimes of the oldest old. And this group is particularly vulnerable. So your policymakers would want to know at the subnational level, how many, not just how many 60 plus, but also how many oldest old are they that might need particular uh, care and, um, and shielding and might be particularly vulnerable to the pandemic. Um, so that's why we, we reached out to World Pop, to World Pop for their support and to, to Esri and the idea of this uh, um, uh, stats brief and webinar came out. Um, and also for us in, um, in the statistics division, our guiding uh, principles are around the fundamental principles of official statistics. And we particularly liked this work because we felt that it lined up very nicely with these principles, that it's, it's cost efficient, it's, you're getting comparable data drawn from a wide variety of sources. It reduces the cost and, and burden because we're not asking anyone to, um, to go out and collect right now individual data. We're aware that a lot of countries haven't had a census for a while. Uh, CRVS um, systems might not be sufficient to produce uh, regular and timely population estimates. But this is a way to actually uh, be able to access this, uh, this data for statistical purposes only without going out and collecting individual data while prioritizing uh, quality and timeliness. So we very much felt that this work fitted uh, well with, uh, with our kind of guiding uh, principles for official statistics. Um, okay, so this is the end of my presentation. Uh, we have our contact details at the end. Um, and this is the, the reason and the motivation behind why we um, decided to move ahead with this, um, with this topic. So I am going to stop sharing. OK, good. And I am going to hand over to our World Pop colleagues to um, go into more detail about these subnational estimates. OK, thank you very much, Petra. I'm just going to share my, my presentation. OK. Can uh, everybody see it? Is it fine? Yes, yes. thank you. OK, perfect. So hello, everyone. Uh, and thanks again to Gemma and Petra for organizing this webinar and inviting us to present. 
Um, so both, uh, both uh, Max and, and myself uh, are part of the WorkPop research program, which, main, uh, uh, which, which is based at the University of Southampton, and uh, which main aim is to develop new methods, uh, mostly to model population distribution, population characteristics, and population mobility, in order, let's say, to improve the demographic evidence base in low and middle income countries. All the demographic data set that we produce are freely available and uh, are produced using open, uh, open methods that are also peer reviewed. And uh, they found application in different areas that include uh, epidemiology, maternal newborn health, and also risk uh, and management uh, uh, in, in case of uh, disasters. So my presentation today is mostly focusing on uh, how our uh, subnational data uh, are produced and in particular our uh, gridded population data set and, uh, and how those data set are then disaggregated by age and sex. So let's start with the population uh, gridded data set. So subnational data based on census, uh, first of all, are interpolated over time using uh, subnational grow rates. And then basically those subnational uh, uh, figures, uh, census based figures, uh, are kind of uh, spatially disaggregated using uh, and uh, uh, machine learning uh, random forest based uh, dosimetric uh, redistribution approach. What is being done uh, is basically uh, the random forest is used to fit a model in which the population density variable are uh, uh, correlated with uh, just partial coverage that are uh, strongly associated with population pre uh, presence. And then basically the fitted uh, uh, model is going to be used to predict uh, population density at the grid cell level using the same stack uh, of coverage. And then uh, the population density output is then used basically as a weighting layer to redistribute the population from the census within each uh, uh, administrative unit. So then, uh, as Petra highlighted, uh, we know that it's very important to understand uh, the location and where, uh, let's say, more uh, more vulnerable groups of population is uh, is located. And for this reason, we are going to basically disaggregate uh, the population in terms of age and sex groups. Okay. Uh, how this is done? This is done by collecting uh, age and sex information from multiple available sources that includes census data, uh, census microdata, household surveys, and then basically also we also collected uh, estimates from uh, the UN Population Division and the census, uh, US Census Bureau uh, for many points in time as possible. And then different demographic methods uh, basically are used to interpolate and extrapolate the subnational age and sex structures between 2000 and 2020 in this case. And then uh, those numbers are converted into proportions. Okay. Then basically once we have the proportion, we are going to combine those proportion with the agent with the population, uh, the gridded population data set by simply multiplying those proportion calculated at the subnational level uh, times the number of people in each uh, grid cell so that we can obtain, uh, let's say, gridded population data set that are breaking down by age and, and sex. Uh, in terms of, and this is done basically for uh, 36 uh, classes uh, of, uh, of, of age group, both, uh, sorry, 18 uh, classes of age group, both for male and, and female. In terms of uh, how we can access this data, there are uh, six main, uh, let's say, entry points uh, that can allow you to access the data uh, for, uh, I mean, for, for the world, uh, let's say, for the, I mean, the data are produced globally, but specifically in this case for the uh, Asia and, uh, and Pacific. So the first one is our website where the data are organized uh, by teams and then uh, are, full, uh, are organized by countries and by years. So once uh, uh, the landing page, the download page uh, is reached, people can uh, uh, download the data uh, by let's say age, age groups and uh, by by sex, and the data provide as a TIFF in a grid format again. 
Then uh, we have, uh, again, for basic user, our uh, WorkPop FTP, where the data are organized again by, by country and uh, the ISO country code is used. So once the country is identified, people can go within uh, the corresponding uh, folder and the data can simply, uh, let's say, drag and drop from the FTP folder to a local folder on their computers. Uh, then uh, to facilitate, let's say, and to support the response to the COVID emergency and so the country response and preparedness, we also developed a World Pop demographic portal in which we are redistributing those uh, uh, proportion that I mentioned before at the subnational level. So basically users can uh, select their country, can select uh, the age and sex group they are interested in, again ranging from zero to one and then every five years up to 80 plus. Uh, they can click on uh, an administrative units of interest and they can basically visualize the age and sex pyramids. Uh, through the portal, also the our data are uh, distributed uh, as a CSV, uh, so as a, let's say tables that can be used for statistical purposes, and they have a field uh, containing uh, administrative uh, uh, administrative names that can be used, let's say, in, in case someone wants to join the table to available polygons represent polygons, yeah, representing administrative units uh, area. Uh, then. For, uh, let's say, more advanced users, we have a REST API application that can be used to query the list of all the data that are available through WorkPop, but also to, let's say, submit spatial queries uh, directly to our data without having to download them uh, using uh, a GeoJSON uh, type of file that are representing, again, those polygons are representing the administrative units. And the users can then uh, get back uh, information about the number of male and female in each uh, age and sex uh, class, uh, let's say within each uh, administrative unit represented by the polygon that is going to be submitted. Uh, in addition, let's say for people that uh, are using GIS software, we developed uh, some kind of uh, add-on or a plugin that can be used, let's say, within those uh, GIS software to, again, browse our data directly within our repository and download uh, whatever file they are interested in that can be uploaded directly in, in the software. This has been done for QGIS and ArcGIS for people that are familiar with those uh, GIS software. And then basically we are uh, currently also made the data available on uh, ArcGIS online for, uh, let's say, Azure, Azure users, where uh, through our uh, WorkPop hub, where the data are available, let's say, at the moment, just for a simple download, very similar to what we have on our website. But we are also currently working to make the data available through ArcGIS Enterprise and serve them as uh, web services uh, so that people, again, can use the data without having to download them, for example, for a web application or, uh, again, to query the data without having to go through the, to the download. Uh, and we are also working on uh, developing uh, dashboards uh, within the ArcGIS online that again can be used to investigate the data and uh, run some sort of queries. Okay, and then yeah, I would just like uh, to conclude highlighting that uh, our data are already being used by multiple UN agencies and also some governments. And here uh, I'm just featuring uh, uh, a report that is basically from UNFPA and is describing the, the states of the Pacific's health works. And I want to thank, uh, let's say, all our uh, uh, funders and uh, collaborators and also, I mean, the whole audience here for your attention. So thank you very much. Thank and you, Alessandro. Stopping now to share, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for such a fantastic presentation. I'm always blown away by what World Pop is doing. It's a um, it's really a fantastic resource. Um, and then, yeah, of course, I may just want to add that uh, we'll we'll be here uh, to this further discuss uh, question yes. at the end. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Um, okay, I hand over now to Linda from Esri, who will talk about how this data then can be analyzed using GIS products. Great. Over Thanks, to you, Linda. Petra. 
Yeah, let me get things into the right mode here. I hope. And you should be seeing my slides. That's right, Pam. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and, and really, thanks for inviting me to participate in this important discussion. Um, what I wanted to go through today was really three key points. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about ArcGIS as an integrated system to help you respond to COVID-19 um, and also highlight some of the tools that we are seeing being applied in the areas of data science and spatial analytics using data like you just saw from, from WorldPop. And um, last but not least also support the programs that we have available uh, for all of the uh, attendees who are listening in today so i want to start with something that you've probably seen uh, before uh, you know the coronavirus is affecting everyone including asia pacific and we've all seen these dashboards i'm sure uh, whether you've seen this one specifically or some similar to it it's really reflective of the devastation that we see happening due to this pandemic um, but what's been interesting for us as geographers is it really is raising people's awareness to the importance of asking the question of where, you know, where is the disease spreading? Who are and where are the vulnerable populations? So questions like these are really waking the world up to the importance of spatial data. And, and this is not new uh, for us here at Esri. We've been uh, working in disaster response uh, literally for decades, uh, going back to the earthquake here in California where I live in, in Northridge uh, more than two decades ago, or the Haiti earthquake um, response to Ebola outbreak in West Africa a few years back. And today we see it uh, being applied in uh, things like visualization, like you see in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, or in analytics, trying to understand and model what's going on, which is where we uh, need that all-important data, and, and to understand who the vulnerable populations are and where they are and what services that they need. Now, GIS can really uh, give us a complete picture, a complete system for understanding and responding to these pandemics. And I want to go into that a little bit deeper. Uh, we've seen uh, several patterns emerge with the use of GIS technology, and it really starts with understanding community risk. Um, we have to then move on to measure how well we're doing with things like social distancing. And we need to be able to model uh, the spread and the impact of the disease. We then need to manage resources, maybe select sites. Those sites could be where we're going to do testing or uh, perhaps where we're going to do food distribution. And we need to be able to communicate out to the public and, and to share information out, keep citizens informed. And so as we think about this process, we think about several steps that we go through along the way from mapping the cases, you know, where are people um, being sick and, and where is it spreading to, how is it moving, uh, where are those vulnerable populations, again, right, this is where we need that subnational data. And to map capacity, where do we have hospital resources, what are the number of beds, do we have available doctors, nurses, and, and again, bringing all of that together with some modeling and analysis and then communicating that information back out to inform the public or inform other agencies and providers who can help us. So we look at a few tools uh, that are used, uh, things like pattern detection, modeling prediction, and site selection are being applied across the board to determine how to distribute resources uh, accurately. Uh, we see uh, models like the CHIME model, which is a model you may be familiar with, um, looking at the forecast spread. And these models help us again to make predictions and understand. In the information model for COVID response, we see a lot of different data layers coming in, but the most important of those, again, in my mind, is the demographic data. What's the socioeconomic status? Um, what are the disaggregations by age, um, you know, by race, by gender? Um, overlaying information such as health conditions or housing density. Of course, all these other layers of data are equally uh, important. You know, we, we have to know, again, where the, the services are, the hospitals. Um, we also have to know 
where testing sites and other things are, but none of that uh, can help us get the full picture without that base demographic data. So if we look at just a couple of examples, uh, looking at how do we determine appropriate testing site locations or how do we determine treatment locations, these have different requirements. For a, for a testing site, I, I may need a location that's very high capacity that will allow for, um, say, cars to drive through or in some neighborhoods for people to walk up. Versus treatment sites where I need to know a lot of other information, the number of doctors, the number of uh, nurses, staff, as well as equipment such as ventilators. So all of these have unique uh, pieces of information that we have to pull into this model. So if we think about this simply, uh, we can think about two basic steps. We need to be able to calculate the population demand and we need to be able to perform what we call location allocation analysis to help us find the best location within a predefined distance. So we, again, we wanna ensure individuals in need have access to the services they need during this crisis. So when we look at this, uh, again, there are different risk services that, uh, surfaces, excuse me, that will come into play. Uh, it could be the transmission risk. Uh, so things like housing density, obviously having an impact, population density, uh, susceptibility. Here's where, again, we want to be able to disaggregate our data, look at it by age bands, look at it by gender, um, look at other conditions that could impact susceptibility accessibility, as well as socioeconomic and exposure risk. So we can look at those and then we can also look at those candidate locations, places where we may be able to establish facilities. And these could be out of the, out of the norm, right? Here in the U.S. we've seen um, hotel parking lots and retail center parking lots used to set up for testing locations. Um, we've seen conference facilities transformed into uh, hospital facilities with extra beds and ventilators. So uh, we want to analyze all of those possible locations with all of those different variables and do a distance calculation, whether we have some road network data to use or we do a simple as the crow flies calculation. And so uh, for all of these, if you uh, click through on the slides, this will take you to a step by step on how to do this type of analysis. Um, so to summarize, what we've talked about is, you know, we want to implement this information model that's going to help us answer some of these questions. To do that, we, we need to prepare our data. We need to have that demographic data, that subnational data that's going to help us understand the community risk. We're going to model the spread of the disease as well as uh, some of the efforts we're taking to mitigate like social distancing. We're going to look at and determine where hospital systems uh, are perhaps exceeding capacity and forecast the impact on beds and ICUs and ventilators with those risk factors and then do some location analysis to help us uh, determine alternate locations. So you can see that data is really important through this process. Now, again, I know we've all seen a lot of different hub sites and dashboard sites, and all of those are really interesting. And, and I would tell you, you know, go visit our site as well. There's, there's examples from all around the globe. But what I find even more interesting are the applications and the information products that I see statistical agencies coming forward with. And I wanted to share this example from the region there. Australia Bureau of Statistics is doing just a phenomenal job um, with sharing out different types of information. And, and of course, like everyone, they started with the basics, right? How do we get the at-risk at population information, age distribution out? But from there, they started to look at some other interesting factors. Um, employment is going to be impacted. Well, it's it's not uh, you know a simple question to understand. And so, uh, first of all, how many people are employed that are age 50 and over? Um, and what categories uh, of industry are they working in? And perhaps we need to look at some of those other at-risk uh, factors like health conditions, underlying health conditions such as diabetes, for example. And the most recent example they shared in the bottom right hand corner is looking at data. This is coming from another agency, from a tax agency, but giving us an, an insight into payroll and jobs. 
So all of these are great examples of what's possible um, with the information coming through your statistical organization. Uh, I wanted to share this example as well because it's not just the big statistical agencies that can do this work. Um, this is really uh, a great example from the small island nation of Montserrat and the Caribbean. Um, we've done a lot of work across that region as well. Montserrat uh, has got about 5,000 in total population, so it is one of the smallest island nations in the world, and yet they are, like everyone else, focused on this. How do we stand up uh, uh, a website? How do we stand up applications? How do we get data and information out to serve our citizens? So you can see there um, with the population distribution by enumeration area on Montserrat, and then they're beginning to look at, okay, now how do we break that down? How do we disaggregate um, by gender, or by age? So some great examples from all around the globe. Um, just to leave you with a couple of resources, again, Esri has put out a lot of tools, and I won't go through all of these, but I, I will just reference you to the website here. You see the URL at the top. We have put out solutions for aiding and response as well as recovery because, you know, we see people starting to move and, and change their behavior, and we need different tools to understand, um, you know, how to respond, how to begin to open business back up, or, or you know, how do we uh, change indoor space space planning, for example. So there's many um, questions that are being considered and we're trying to um, stay ahead and build as many tools as we can to help all of you. Uh, there are a couple of key programs that you should be aware of. If you're not, we do have a statistics modernization program. That's uh, in effect uh, year round and, and will continue actually uh, through the 2030 round. So for those of you who aren't aware of it and want more information, the link is there. But I would also encourage you to take a look at the disaster response program. We do have a very uh, generous program that's available for any agency to come and apply to to get resources from us. And most recently, we announced a, a partnership with WHO. Um, this also is helping with healthcare ministries. And so anyone who's a WHO member state or a partner in, in what they call GORIN, which is their Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, uh, can reach out and again get access to free resources, you know, uh, ArcGIS technology, all of these templates and other things. So with that, I will stop and um, thank you very much for your time and Petra, throw it back to you. Thanks, Linda. Thank you for such a fantastic presentation. Um, so as you probably have seen that we've called this the, the Stats Cafe, and we've called it that for a reason. First of all, we hope that everyone's got themselves a good cup of coffee. Though those in the, it's easier for us here in Europe where it's um, early in the morning. Those in the Pacific, I, maybe you just need a hot chocolate. Um, but what we want to do is to have um, uh, a discussion, a Q&A session, which is going to be more informal. So we really do invite you to, to jump in. Um, there is um, on the black bar that um, uh, Gemma referred to earlier, you can see that there's a hand raise function so that we can know that you want to speak. And if you prefer, you can also type uh, any questions or that you want to speak in the, the meeting chat, which we're monitoring as well. Um, so if uh, there are any questions or any points to discussion, please, um, please raise your hand or, or type in the Q&A. I know uh, why people might be thinking of questions. Um, I know that Gemma, you had one that you wanted to ask. Yeah, thank you very much, Petra. Um, and thank you both, um, Alessandro, Max, and, and, and all, and Linda for your presentations there. I just wanted to um, reflect um, very briefly. Um, um, Alessandro, as part of your presentation there, you shared with, shared with us six six ways that countries can access the um, age and sex data from the World Pop um, website. And I'm just not quite sure if if you shared with us whether that data is uh, freely available um, and whether there is a cost associated with countries accessing that data. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly with um, Linda, I noticed you mentioned a statistics modernization program 
maybe if you're able to share with countries whether um, there, there is a um, availability to countries in the region of access to the GIS software. So those were my two questions. Thank you, Alessandro. Yeah. Yep. So no, all, all our data are basically freely available uh, for being downloaded uh, and you can use uh, any of the six, uh, let's say, entry points that uh, I, I quickly described to access the data and to use the data. And in addition to the data themselves uh, that again are coming either as a gridded format, mostly TIFF or as a shape file uh, or as tables. Uh, you can also refer to the documentation and the methods that uh, have been used to produce uh, to produce those data. All of them are kind of uh, peer reviewed and they are published on, uh, re 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 let's say, scientific articles. And we are more than happy to provide, uh, you know, th those resources uh, in case uh, you cannot find them. And also, let's say, yeah, also for our data that are available to ArcGIS online, they are part of the open data platform of, uh, of Esri. So er everything is completely free and people can just go there, download them, use them. And uh, yeah, and yeah, so it's. And if you need help, let's say you can even contact us and we are we will be more than happy to support, uh, you know, uh, yeah, NSOs or whoever feel that they want to use our data both technically and uh, let's say giving a scientific explanation of how the data were produced. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ali. Um, we have um, Dia Ikawati who would like to ask a question. It would actually be really helpful if you could also tell us which organization you're from. Um, we can't hear you. Um, Is it me? Mm. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yes. yes. Oh. It's me. Yeah. Um, I have just put this question. My name is Reiko Hayashi. I'm from Japan uh, of National Institute of Population and Social Security Research. And then it was interesting to see the um, comparison between Italy and Korea. And then actually the population structure is the same. And then the expected number of deaths is, is somewhat similar. But in reality, Korean total death by COVID-19 was only 200 barriers. In Italy, it should be 100 times more, something like that. So it means that in COVID-19, there is this difference between countries, the mobility and mortality rate. So how is cap or how can we do with this difference? Mm -hmm. Maybe I should just answer that one because I think it refers to, to my presentation. Um, I, I should say that what we did, it was just applying exactly the same scenario the, to different population age sex structures, now, which we know is not, it's not a projection of any kind, it's not a prediction, it's just a, a simulation of a, of a certain scenario, just to show the impact of age and sex for exactly the same uh, infection prevalence rate and exactly the same case fatality rates. Now we know that uh, certain countries will have different uh, pre infection but, prevalence if they've taken steps to stop it or if the, the treatment's different. So it's in no way a real world um, example because it's- So I which mean, country example did you use? It was which applying, mortality? Um, it was applying, um, they, they, the, it was, a model that they did using 10% infection prevalence rate and the case fatality rates of Italy. So of in Italy? all the countries, yeah, ah, they just okay. applied uh -huh. the, the demographers who did this, they applied those infection rates to, to the uh, population structure and the case, same case fatality rates. The idea was just to kind of decompose the, um, the mortality into the uh, actual the, the the demographic effect and then the the additional effect so you get an idea of how much the demography is important but it's not actually it's not a projection and you know, we say this in the stats brief no no i understand this I, is not a projection it is and it's not a real life situation the age yeah. sex specific exactly. this rate applied to the age structure this is the, the very specific very standard age standardization and then exactly. the outcome is completely different so exactly. that is the point which is very interesting and maybe we can work yes exactly exactly that yeah um i think that 
thank thank you for that question. But um, I think we, uh, if we can go to to Dia, um, can you? Okay, Petra. Thank you. This is Dia. Hi. Okay. Okay. So go ahead, please. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Dia from Statistics Indonesia. Yes, we do agree that data is more important than ever in this pandemic situation, especially not only demographic data such as age, age and sex, but also other corresponding data and additional data. However, there are challenges in the data collection during this COVID-19 pandemic since face to face interaction is restricted. So we come with some other method of data collection uh, such as like now we are using big data related to that how how do we cope with the methodology since there is no standardized concept as well as methodologies of all those data that come from different sources how do we overcome the challenge in order to produce reliable data mm -hmm. i think that's all petra thank you um i think that maybe uh Ali and Maxim might be best place to answer this. How because you use a wide variety of sources. Yeah, what we're estimates. trying. To, yeah, what <laughs> we're trying to do basically is is like uh, I mean again sourcing as much data as we can from different sources, and then we are trying to let's say harmonize uh, harmonize them, and uh, I mean like. I mean, in the end, when we are obtaining, let's say, when multiple sources are available, another thing that we are trying to do to sort of validate our results is trying to produce the same output using different sources of data to try to understand how robust our output is. And most importantly, what we are trying to do is uh, uh, establishing, let's say, a common uh, workflow, a common methodology to work with this data. So that uh, in in the end, uh, whatever we are going to obtain is sort of comparable across country and within countries. Uh, that's mm -hmm. so. I think when you when you have to yeah to deal with the data coming from uh, multiple sources, uh, the best way is trying to establish uh, let's say uh, I mean a common workflow and a common methodology so that at least all the data are treated the same way, and this is going to ensure a little bit of uh, consistency. Yeah, I, I might just add to that, Petra. I mean, this is where location is really important, right? You, you've got to have that location component in the different data sources so you can harmonize that data together. Mm. Yeah, um, Gemma, would you like to add to that? Mm. Yeah, thank very much, Petra. Um, so this question of using or, um, big data sources and alternative data sources um, is um, a very good one to be asking, and we are getting quite a lot of questions about that. So Petra, in her presentation, um, shared with you the, you know, the, the the fundamental principles of official statistics that we adhere to in the official statistics world, and one of the principles actually says use uses you know use the data sources that are available to you. Um, and it doesn't just say use survey or census data, it also says use administrative data, use data sources having respect to their quality, their availability and the cost to providers. So the data that is available here to you that we've just seen from World Pop um, is data that is available to you now. And not only is it available, it also comes with very extensive metadata and scientific um, papers that you've just heard from Alessandro that um, give full transparency to the methods and standards and frameworks that World Pop have used in producing that data. So to, to me, this is a very good example. Um, and just really to reiterate a point Petra made at the start that um, here, here we have um, really a quite powerful big data source that's made even more powerful by being location and geospatially enabled, and it's got transparent methods. It's um, it's downloadable and accessible through tools like um, ArcGIS um, and available to you now. Um, and um, it, to me, to me, it is it is a, a big data source that's very consistent with the fundamental principles of official statistics 
be, because of its transparency of methods um, and the and and a variety of other reasons, but certainly that contributes to it. So I would encourage you to to make use of make use of this data source and the and the link through to the GIS is extremely powerful. Thank you. Yeah, and another point, if I may, is that uh, when we are combining data from different sources, uh, we may use them, uh, let's say, to reduce the bias that each uh, each data set uh, is coming with, uh, while at the same time we can leverage uh, uh, whatever advantages advantages they they present. For example, if we think about the temporal coverage, if we think about the standard census data, uh, they are collected every 10 years, for example, but if we integrate the census uh, with maybe surveys or other sources, uh, we, we can basically improve the, their temporal coverage. And uh, yeah, this is kind of uh, adding some value to the final product. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, from, from this, matters i think uh, we come up with we we can we can say that uh, for for the future the data integration is very important <laughs> from other sources <laughs> yeah i think that's all thank you petra thank you um i'd like to go to uh, omar who had his hand up if you have a question hello colleagues um can you hear me yes uh, my name is Omar Sadiq and I work in the SCAP Sustainable Urban Development section. Um, so this work that you've presented is very relevant for the technical assistance um, programs that we're providing to local governments in their socioeconomic recovery of COVID-19. Um, I had a question about the GIS visualization tool. If spatially you are able to also use it to compare slum versus non-slum areas, um, this, as well as peri-urban areas, um, which often have different administrative boundaries um, that are sometimes unclear. Um, this is important because from our support to local governments, this is quite a demand um, to be able to show the differences between neighborhoods um, because things like social distancing are structurally not possible um, in informal settlements that we're finding. And our region has the highest number of informal settlements um, globally. Over. Okay. Yeah, I'm shaking my head. I was on mute. Sorry. Um, it's it's a great question, Omar, and it it is possible uh, with GIS tools to do that sort of analysis. It is um, reliant on the data that's underneath it, though. So, um, if I wanted to use, for example, satellite imagery or aerial imagery, um, I can begin to look at you know patterns on the ground and see what's going on. Um, you know, using data like WorldPop has to try to begin to look at those really dense locations, then I could overlay imagery on top of that and, and start to see what those patterns are, where are those informal settlements, and are there actually, um, you know, correlations between that data. I'm, I'm sure that the WorldPop team uh, sees that in, in their analysis. Yeah, we, we are using like, uh, yeah, slums area and refugee camps as one of the just partial coverage that I mentioned before to understand the relationship between population density and, uh, you know, coverage that uh, we know are strongly correlated with population presence. Uh, so, and, and those locations, of course, are going to inform uh, the random forest model and then uh, um, allowing us uh, to redistribute, let's say, higher densities in those sort of location rather than in others uh, where we are expecting a lower density. Yeah, just to add that uh, this kind of data is also available on Wallpop. We have a big stack of the covariates like distance to roads, distance to water, and all these covariates can be used and it's freely available to download from Wallpop website. Yeah. For for the whole world, basically for all countries, Asia as well. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. We have one more uh, question, and I have a question as well to the audience. I want to be able to ask, but let's see if Halima can can connect. Um, he has a question, but he said he's having problems with connectivity. Halima, if you're not able to connect, please type your question in the chat box, and we'll we can address it. No, he's left. Okay. Um, so my question is to the to the audience and participants. Um, we've seen here a whole wealth of different um, resources. What kind of support do you need for us to be able to 
to to support you rather in um in accessing and using the these materials um if you have any i any ideas or any input we were thinking of perhaps doing further webinars or uh, other ways of virtually providing support and input into using um, these resources. And we'd really like to know if this would be helpful or useful and if, if it's something you'd be interested in participating in um, in the future. Hi, Gemma, it's Tracy from State TNZ here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes thanks. Great. I, I was just going to um, say I'm involved in Stats NZ's Pacific Program, Pacific Statistics Support Program, um, and I'm not sure if there are others here from the ABS or SPC that are also involved in that, but there has been some discussion about um, the ABS running some leadership sessions with GSs from different Pacific government departments. Mm -hmm. So this might be something that could be tailored or, or relevant to them. Not sure if as I say, if many were able to attend today or were aware and things, but yeah, possibly something that could connect through um, to, to that. Um, happy to help if I can, but I know you'll have your own connections through SPC and ABS as well. But yeah, definitely think having had a look at what data is available for Samoa and many of the Pacific countries that we support, particularly the smaller ones like Nui, Tokelau, that have populations of 1,500. Um, and seeing your example, Linda, is extremely um, extremely useful. Um, I guess the next challenge is, like you, Gemma, what, what capacity and capability do um, some of the small NSOs have to make full use of this type of information? Mm -hmm. But thank you all for sharing your um, knowledge and expertise today and to UNESCAP mm -hmm. for organising. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would like just to give, see if Halima would like to ask a question. Let me maybe have one or two more minutes. Um, I can see we have a question um, in the box around um, using this type of information to determine random sampling stratification strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, can we, could we use this for, for sampling? There, yeah, there, there are uh, specific uh, uh, work about using grid population data set uh, to plan a survey. I can provide uh, resources and I can also put you in touch with colleagues that are specifically working on this area. But definitely, yeah, I'm, I'm aware that, uh, yeah, especially even within our group, uh, there are some colleagues working specifically on using population grid data to yeah to stratify and plan uh, basically uh, surveys so mm. yeah great mm. okay um, so I think that um, we can bring this Q and A session to a close and I'll uh, hand back to to Gemma thank you thank you very much Petra and um, look, I'd like to extend my thanks to Alessandro and Maxim and Petra um, and uh, Linda for three really wonderful presentations. Our, our aim here today was to present you with some very practical advice on data that's available. Uh, and we heard from Alessandro that it's uh, freely available on the website for national and subnational. It's got, um, it's been packaged in such a way that it can be imported into GIS tools like we heard from Linda, ArcGIS, um, QGIS, um, there is um, facilities out there and packages out there like the Stats Modernisation Program that's available to you to get access to those tools. And just really bringing it back to stressing the, the value of having this age, sex and subnational data available for you to um, help your governments in their planning, their response, their analysis of the COVID-19 situation and beyond. So I'd like to extend my thanks to, to all the presenters today. And I'd also like to extend my thanks to all the people who joined us in the chat. Um, we, at one stage we had about 80 or nine, but around 90 I think was our peak.
But really good questions today, and I'm really pleased that you got into the spirit of the coffee. I also had my uh, coffee <laughs> cup with me here today. Um, I'm really pleased uh, that we got into um, very valuable questions around um, access to these tools, to this data, as well as what it might be able to be used for, such as for sampling uh, purposes. Um, I just want to, before closing, I'd like to draw your attention to, we have another Stats Cafe series uh, next week. Um, many qu countries in the region asked us for some uh, share, opportunity to share experiences of the impact of COVID-19 on survey operations. So next week we'll be hearing um, about some, some experiences of how countries have been able to keep keep their survey operation procedures going, particularly their labour force surveys uh, during the times of COVID-19. So please do join us for that. And we will make this recording, the presentations and the um, um, slideshows available on our website to you. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, really has been a pleasure joining you for this first Stats Cafe today and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.